Welcome to today's BSI webinar entitled Cybersecurity in the Aviation, Space, and Defense Sector. In an effort to minimize background noise, we have muted all phone lines. As always, we encourage questions, comments throughout the presentation using the chat box located on the left-hand side of your screen. This applies to any technical assistance you may need, as well as submitting questions which will be answered at the end if time permits. All of today's participants will receive a link to enroll in a recording of today's event. And lastly, we ask you to participate in a brief survey following the web conference. We appreciate feedback suggestions to improve our future conferences. Before I turn it over to our presenters, allow me a few moments of introduction. Today's webinar is led by Brendan Hill. Brendan has been in aviation and engineering for 40 years, including 26 years as a British Army officer and aircraft engineer. He has worked with BSI's assurance and certification for over 10 years and worked in the industry as a group quality manager for three factories, two CNC manufacturing plants, which supplied aerospace as well as oil and gas, and one producing factory manufacturing software. Brendan is joined today by Stephen Scott, Senior Manager for Information Governance with BSI's Cybersecurity and Information Resilience Group. Stephen is an experienced consultant whose expertise spans information security, risk management, IT service management, data protection, and regulatory compliance. Stephen has worked across a wide range of organizations, including financial insurance and manufacturing. And now I will turn it over to Brendan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. As uh, has just been said, you are uh, with us too. That's Stephen on the right, myself on the left, and we're going to take you through uh, a few things. First of all, we're going to do a very brief introduction to BSI, for those of you who aren't aware of the breadth of what we do. And then we're going to look at cybersecurity, understand what the risks are, how big the problem is. We're going to look at standards and regulations that pertain to cybersecurity. And then finally, the actions. What can we do about it? Uh, and as I said, we'll have some questions at the end if you uh, would care to uh, type those in. So let's kick off. A brief introduction to BSI, the British Standards Institute. Uh, we were the world's first national standards body. So we stand, started in 1901, so we've been around for quite a while. And we are a founding member of ISO. Uh, so we've written 37,000 plus standards that we've uh, uh, developed over the years. And we have offices in 193, or we work in 193 countries around the world with 90 offices globally and we have 86,000 odd clients. So we're a global organization able to support you in all aspects of, uh, of business. And the important thing is that we are also an innovator, we are creative. A lot of the standards with which you'll be familiar came from BSI. So if we look at some of the favorites, BS5750 morphed into ISO 9001, ISO 14001, the environmental standard, that too started off as a British standard, BS5750. Health and safety, ISO 45001 started off as BS 8800, and so on. And importantly, the relevant one, of course, ISO 27001 started off as BS 7799. So we've been innovating throughout our entire existence, and we're here to support industry, make industry more resilient, and make business more resilient. And we keep ourselves at the forefront. It doesn't stop there. We continue to innovate in a wide variety of impactful areas that shape the future of business and society, including the Internet of Things and the security between them, the ability to ensure full compliance with data security, privacy, and integrity, and ethical use of robots and artificial intelligence. And we're looking at smart cities. So we're at the forefront of technology where the innovators and uh, and we're here to support every aspect of every industry. And we have various branches of our organization, which where appropriate are entirely separate. So consulting, for example, is totally separate from the certification side of things. So we can do consulting, training, certification, auditing, um, testing and verification. We started a life as, as a test house. So we've been <coughs> carrying out product testing uh, throughout our entire existence. And of course, knowledge and standards. We write and create a large number of the world's standards. Excuse me a moment. That frog is now out of my throat. I apologize for that. And uh, we have a, a standard BS 65000, which is organizational resilience. I'm going to talk about that later. 
And there are three domains within organizational resilience, and the pertinent one for this is information resilience. And it looks at all aspects of information security, and uh, we'll be talking about that a bit later. But cloud security, privacy, personal information, network systems, vulnerability scanning, pen testing, NIST, payment card industry data, security awareness, all these things are within our scope and within our bounds. So we'll be looking at information resilience as it pertains pertains to aerospace. And in terms of our client base, where well, we work with some of the biggest companies around the world, 49% of the Fortune 500, 75% of the FTSE 100, 77% of the Nikkei, and all those names there you can see that we're, uh, we're partners with uh, some of the biggest organizations in the world. So moving swiftly on to the subject in hand, cybersecurity. How big is the problem? What are the risks and what are the different aspects? Okay, I'm now going to show you a picture of me on a Monday morning. There we are. That's the problem. Data is growing exponentially. And 90% of all the data used globally was produced in the last two years. So it's an exponential growth rate, which is truly scary. Every system, every organization, every, every aircraft, every vehicle is growing uh, more and more data year on year. It's becoming overburdening. But importantly, of all that data, only 4% of data breaches were where encryption was used. So 96% of all data breaches, there was no encryption, and therefore the data was potentially usable. So there are simple things that people can do to prevent uh, or to build in cybersecurity, and then the more advanced things. We're going to cover quite a few of those over the course of this uh, webinar. So on to some error specifics then. What's the vulnerable stuff in aircraft? This is a 757, and the US Department of Homeland Security wanted to see whether it's possible to hack an aircraft remotely. We've all seen in the news things about vehicles being hacked and organizations or individuals taking control of the steering or the brakes on a car. Of course, if you put that into the world of aviation, it becomes rather more interesting. Now, this was done by the Homeland Security, so the good guys. But the point is, if the good guys can do it, so can the bad guys. So anyone in software development for aircraft or for systems needs to consider this aspect. We talk about the Internet of Things. What about the Internet of Aircraft? Connectivity will only grow. And within that, if we look at uh, a flaw, a flaw is an unintended functionality, maybe either the result of poor design or through mistakes made during implementation. Flaws may go undetected for a significant period of time. And the majority of common attacks we see today exploit these types of vulnerabilities. In the last 12 months, nearly 8,000 unique and verified software vulnerabilities were disclosed in the US National Vulnerability Database. So it's a big issue. And then if we look at a feature, a feature is intended functionality, but that can be misused by an attacker to breach a system. Features may improve the user's experience or help diagnose problems or improve management, but they can also be exploited by an attacker. So in all aspects of our design, development, etc., we need to consider these things. Thinking about the way an aircraft works, this was an article uh, a year or two ago, and there has been some debate about the uh, veracity of this, but nevertheless, because this was in the public domain, the headlines were writ large and reputations were damaged. The allegation was that a person on an aircraft hacked the in-flight entertainment system and through that overwrote the code on the aircraft's thrust management computer. Those of you aware of this will be aware of the uh, discussion about it. But nevertheless, whether it's true or not, the, the, the reputation was damaged. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in some of the uh, other examples a bit later on. These are examples of uh, intellectual property and indeed uh, security, uh, national security data being stolen, losing information on things like the F-22, the C-17, national bodies that are stealing sensitive data, military data and export control data, exploiting vulnerabilities in systems somewhere in the supply chain. It could be anywhere in the supply chain. And this is the point. If you're a uh, no matter where you are in the supply chain, you've got to think about 
vulnerabilities above you, vulnerabilities below you, as well as vulnerabilities within your own systems. A lot of organizations use third-party code on websites and apps, and you've got to be continually aware of any weak points in the security of those. Where does it come from? What about the, uh, the hardware and the firmware within it? So there may be things that you're buying something that you think is sound. A lot of people use it, so it must be all right. But what have you done in terms of due diligence to really look at it, to really understand what vulnerabilities might be there? And this is the thing. We're all aware of burglars. We've all got uh, security or something on our houses. We have gates, we have doors, we have locks, we have windows with locks on. But if you leave the window open, that's where the burglar is going to go. He's going to find the weakest point in. And the same thing applies to cybersecurity. What are the weaknesses built into your hardware, hardware, your firmware? What are the backdoor weaknesses that might be there that you're unaware of? We spoke just now about um, the alleged hacking on aircraft. Let's think about how these things join together. Aircraft connectivity has doubled between 2017 and 2019, and this is early days. We're all aware of the big data phenomenon. It's becoming uh, massive. There is a lot of data around the ether. Aircraft are constantly streaming data, and systems on aircraft are becoming more more uh, automated, more software, more systems. So we have electronic flight bags. A large proportion of airlines are bringing them in. If they haven't got them already, then they're going down that route. Norwegian Airways, for example, announced just recently that pretty much all their systems go ele electronic. And that's the EFBs as well as the in-flight entertainment. In-flight entertainment, wireless is the way ahead because every aircraft up until now pretty much has a, a little PC screen in front of every passenger. So you have two or 300 seats there with screens, with all the wiring. That's massive weight, massive cost on the aircraft. Why have that? Why, do, why not just have a wireless in-flight system? Every person on the aircraft has a tablet or a smartphone. They can just log into the in-flight entertainment system over the Wi-Fi, and there you have saved all the weight. You can maybe even get a bit more freight or a couple more seats in. But everybody on that aircraft is connected. And uh, that in-flight entertainment may also include connectivity through the ground, through satellites. And then we have the crew wireless services, cockpit and cabin services. Aircraft or aircraft operators, again, are bringing these in. So everything's becoming joined up. Everything's becoming software-based. We're going away from the old analog way of doing things. So let's look at how that joins up. This is an article from last week, so it's very recent a hacking conference in Las Vegas. A speaker said that he had found holes in the software used in a computer network aboard an aircraft. Uh, there are three systems, essentially the in-flight entertainment, we just spoke about the crew and maintenance systems, and then the critical onboard systems for the aircraft, the vital avionics that control the operation of the aircraft, its sensors and so on. And the chat basically said that through the in-flight entertainment, he got into the other systems. He found flaws, we mentioned flaws earlier on, uh, he found flaws in the software and he could theoretically get into different parts of the aircraft including the avionics equipment, so potentially could take over the operation or control of certain aspects of the aircraft. Now, the, uh, the manufacturer in question has said that there were dividers between the systems, there were protocols to prevent getting from one system to the other and into the other. Um, but you have to ask, uh, every day in the news, there are examples of systems that people thought were safe being hacked. And how did that come about? Well, the journalists that researched this, they spoke to the engineers, and they found that the WIP, the work in progress software for that aircraft, was stored on a server, but it was open to the internet. So maybe they'd thought about securing the aircraft, securing their systems as they manufacture and so on, but the development guys, for some reason, had left that server open to the network. So even before the aircraft was built, somebody, at least one person that we know of, had got onto that system and started exploring its vulnerabilities. What we don't know, of course, is 
who else has been in there? Who else has looked at those vulnerabilities and started thinking about what might be able to be done? It's an unknown. And then we move on to big data, the constant streaming air to ground. Engine manufacturers in particular see this as key to their future offerings. They want more on-wing time and less maintenance time. So they're looking at the true operating parameters, operating data from an aircraft engine. What are the real temperatures throughout the engine? What is the real OAT? What are the real um, throttle settings? What are the real thermal stresses on that engine? And therefore, how, what can they predict as the real points of failure? Constant streaming of data. Any data should be considered a vulnerability. So there you are, you're streaming data. You've got all this connectivity going on. <clears throat> Sounds like a good idea. You've got the most on-wing time because you're streaming the data. So what? Well, an interesting point. This chap said that every satellite should be assumed to be hacked. So that's military as well as civil. So that's quite an interesting and damning statement. There's more behind that, of course, but it should be assumed that every satellite has been hacked. So all the big data streaming we were speaking about just now, even the onboard Wi-Fi systems will be satellite-based rather than uh, air-to-ground. It's air-to-satellite-to-ground. So let's think about the fact that all those satellites should be assumed to be hacked. What are the potential consequences for that security of all that data? Cap Gemini has been to analysis of the Internet of Things, or for us, the Internet of Aircraft. And it makes the point here about the paradox. You have, on the one side, the desire for greater connectivity. High-tech manufacturers want to get all their information out, whether it's supply chain information, aircraft operating information, performance data, location data, system data, all the things we've spoken about now. Ideally, they would all be open and connected and work together and synchronized and harmonized. The paradox comes that you need to have security in there. So we need to apply paradoxical thinking when we're looking at our systems, whether that's internal systems, whether it's products, whatever it might be. So let's look at a few issues that have appeared over the last few years. US think tanks hacked by foreign groups Rather pertinent and uh, rather concerning. North Korea hackers reported to have stolen large caches of military information from South Korea. So think about the national defense aspects of that. Hackers stealing data from a US Navy contractor being investigated by the FBI looking at information on supersonic missiles. So national security, national defense compromise potentially depending on what they've got. In the UK, GCHQ, which is our uh, National Intelligence Monitoring Service, has said that cybersecurity is as big a threat as terrorism. Arguably, it's probably a bigger threat. And fairly recently, the Australia is a big buyer of the F-35, lovely aircraft, but Navy data was stolen in an extensive hack. 30 gigabytes of data compromised in a hack on a government contractor. And the point in there is it was a contractor. Somewhere down the supply chain, someone somewhere didn't have enough cyber security. So you've got to think about it at all levels. This was interesting. Just to get some flavor of just how big the issue is. 6.4 billion fake emails every day. That's a bigger number than I can even think about. But that's going out every day. US government officials, 1,464 of them using Password 123 is their password. Nobody's ever going to think of that one. Two million identities stolen to make fake comments into a US inquiry. Now think about that if your people, if your staff uh, have their identity stolen, what are the possible effects? How will that affect their performance if they know about it? And might that affect their performance at work, their concentration, the human factors, depending on what work they're doing? Uh, what might make them vulnerable to uh, bribery. There may be something in there they don't want anyone to uh, find out about, so they may be vulnerable to bribery. So stolen identity can be critical to the individual, but also crit critical to you as an organization. The average cost of a data breach in 2016 is down there as 3.62 million. 
I'm going to show you some other figures in a moment, which uh, are rather larger and rather scarier. But that was the average cost in 2016. Phishing emails, 550 million by one campaign. One campaign, scary. And phishing is probably one of the most common ways that organizations try to get into your organization. Click on an email, open up something nefarious, and before you know it, you've got some malware on your on your server just because somebody in your organization wasn't aware of the risks. 77% of organizations still operate with only limited cyber security. I was at a cyber conference in uh, Farnborough Air Show, sorry, uh, Paris, Paris Air Show this year. And it, the indication was that only 10% of organizations there have any real sense of cyber security and cyber security systems in place. And where they do have systems in place, they just have the firewall. Oh, we've got a firewall, so we'll be fine. It's got the eggshell approach, which really is not robust. It really isn't effective. So prevention is key, but then we have to ask ourselves, what about detection? What if you don't know that data is being lost? And that goes on for a protracted period of time. This organization in the UK, Dixon's Carphone Warehouse, now they're a IT organization, they sell car phones, they sell um, PCs and laptops. You'd think they'd be good at that. They didn't know about a data breach for a year. That data was being stolen for a year. Customer data, personal data, what are the possible consequences of that? And if we look at the IP side of things, a $23 Raspberry Pi, in fact there were a couple of them, put into the systems for NASA and it hacked NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And that, too, was undetected for 10 months. So it's not just prevention, it's detection. If we look at examples of the costs, then, I just said earlier on that the average was 3.6 million. Let's look at some big companies. 99 million pounds, a GDPR breach for Marriott Hotels. And look again at the time frame. It was compromised in 2014 and not discovered until 2018. 339 million guest records exposed. I wouldn't want to be one of those persons. Sadly, I probably am because I stay at the Marriott quite often. So they may have my data. More recently, British Airways, they had a £183 million pound fine for a data breach. 500,000 customers' data harvested by the attackers. And that was through the website. It was diverted from the website. And what they took was financial data. They took web, um, credit card information. Equifax, um, another rather large fine, $700 million to settle a data breach. Look at the top, though. Failed to take basic steps to prevent a data breach. Basic steps. And that's the thing that seems to be missing. People are complacent. Uh, they think they're okay, and basic steps are really not enough. We're in a high-tech industry. We need to be way more advanced than the basic steps. Most of those we've mentioned so far are either large industries with a lot of reliance on software or even companies who, for whom their core trade is software and hardware. But everybody is vulnerable. And then WannaCry, denial of service. This brought Britain's NHS, the National Health Service, a lot of problems, German Railways, Denmark's Maersk, which is a shipping company, FedEx, and then Boeing. Boeing was hit by WannaCry at one of its plants. So denial of service can cripple an organization, throws them into chaos. Now, what if it was an aircraft? What if that was an aircraft system that was having uh, been hacked and unable to operate at a critical part of the flight? So risks, issues, they're applicable to everybody. And these are the kind of things that we've got to think about. Loss of personal data, employees, customers, and suppliers. So your employees, if you lose their data, it could affect them in many ways. We mentioned earlier on their performance, human factors, vulnerability to um, bribery or corruption. They might uh, be led to steal your data because somebody's got a hold on them. Uh, your customer's data, your supplier's data, all of those things are critical. Intellectual property, your designs. People spend years designing new products. Massive investment, 
three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, who knows what. Somebody steals your design, they go to market before you. Not only have you lost those years of uh, revenue, but actually you've lost all the previous years of investment as well. Those designs are critical. And commercial strategy, who are your competitors? Who are you up against? I'm sure they'd like to know what you're bringing along in the next three years, five years, what your commercial strategy is, what your investment is. So a lot of things uh, have got to be thought about. Uh, intellectual property of your customers. If you're manufacturing, if you're in the supply chain, tier one, tier two, wherever you might be, people are going to be giving you CAD models, CAM models, um, designs, software, whatever it is. How do you protect that? Porting systems, where are you buying your software from? What is the firmware you're buying in? What is the hardware? Streaming data, we've spoken about streaming data. We've spoken about the infrastructure that uh, links all these things. And then there is cloud security. So you contractually protect these things. You're legally obliged to protect these things. For airports, there's passengers, data, movement, passport control, surveillance systems. I'm sure we've all seen Mission Impossible 1, 2, 3, and 4, and they always hack into the camera systems, take over the, uh, the various systems in the, in, in the building. Now, if that happens in an airport, the, uh, the risks are significant. Customs, border services, homeland defense. What about air traffic control? If air traffic control is interrupted or is given false data, whether it's radar or comms, air to ground, ground to air, those are significant vulnerabilities. Even if the air traffic control was just made inoperative, you've got hundreds or thousands of aircraft in the air without the, without the air traffic control to pre, uh, prevent accidents, incidents, uh, air to air, and so on. High risk. And then, of course, the next thing coming is 5G. 5G is the big thing we spoke about. It opens up great new possibilities of connectivity Connectivity also means vulnerability. For aircraft operators, you've got big data streaming, communications, onboard systems, in-flight entertainment, electronic flight bags. Every system or every, every antenna should be consistent, considered to be a possible means of entry. And then, of course, we have the passenger data. We've seen examples of the recent hacks of websites, apps, and so on. All of these can compromise your operations, compromise your corporate reputation, and lead to very large fines, particularly with the new GDPR rules. The manufacturers and MROs, in-house systems, Wi-Fi CNC programs, how do you share that information around the building? And going on from that, the 5G, a revolution in manufacturer and MRO. We can have wireless factories, predictive maintenance, intelligence services, autonomy, mobile machinery, Internet of Things, stroke Internet of Aircraft, 5G is going to make a massive difference. We need to think now about how we're going to capitalize on that openness and connectivity, how we're going to protect it. Uh, we also have the recipients of the big data, the streaming, the onboard systems, the health and use, uh, usage monitoring systems, test equipment, and then software. There's deliverable software, which the manufacturers will do. And then in the MROs, they may well be doing updates. Where are the vulnerabilities in those? We all know how software can uh, have significant effect on an aircraft. There's the very sad examples of the uh, 737s recently. I'm not saying they were hacks, but I'm just saying the, the effect that software can have can be disastrous. So effects can be systems thrown into chaos, denial of service, corporate reputation. Reputations are Hard to win, is it easy to lose? Financial loss, loss of assets, intellectual properties, and the one we should all dread, aircraft accidents and incidents. Flight safety is paramount. So we need to think about it up, down, left and right, top to bottom, in all directions. Not just internally, we need to think about it externally. Identify risks in all aspects of your business. Looking at 5G, the Department of uh, Defense has said they are increasingly concerned about the vulnerability of systems being compromised because in the past, they've been able to have bespoke systems operating in a siloed environment. 
But with 5G, not going to happen. They're having to work on commercial off-the-shelf systems. And so there are built-in vulnerabilities from this advancing technology. So the risk of inadvertent or malicious activity exploring these vulnerabilities means the DOD systems and networks uh, are considered by themselves now to be at risk. So we're all part of this chain and we're all customers. Every, every, every way in and out of an aircraft, now you can look at an aircraft here, equally well you could make this a picture of your factory or your MRO. Every point of entry is a potential vulnerability. Every antenna, every system uh, is a potential way into your your aircraft or your systems or your factory, your OMRO. So if you think about it in, in that way, where are the vulnerabilities? What do I need to protect? And this, this for me is a big question. We've looked at many examples of reported incidents and the world tends to work on the uh, Pareto, the 80-20 rule, or the iceberg rule if you wish to call that. So where are we? Are we detecting 80%? and missing 20, or is it the other way around? How many cyber attacks are not detected? Uh, and bottom line is, nobody knows. So we just have to assume that it's a big problem and we need to do everything we can to protect against it. So let's see what standards say. I'm going to start with the aerospace scheme, the 9100 series. What does that say about this? Well, it's got a a fairly blanket statement, really, when documented information is managed electronically, data protection processes shall be defined. Protection from loss, unauthorized changes, unintended alteration, corruption, physical damage. So all the things we've been speaking about are covered in one simple statement, really, in the AS 9100 standard. It doesn't say anything about how you do it. It doesn't require that you follow any particular standards or protocols. But you might ask yourself, if you're required to do that, what's the best way of demonstrating to a client or a customer or a potential customer that you have those things in place? I would suggest that certification to pertinent standards would be a good way ahead. The relevant standards might be 27001, for example. So it's having those systems in place, but also being able to demonstrate it for commercial advantage. And of course, behind all these things, standards are one thing. But behind all these things, there also needs to be a culture. Uh, in BSI ourselves, we are 27,000 certified, as you might hope and expect. And a large proportion of the work that's been done in BSI has been about educating and training everybody in the organization, awareness of the potential risks, phishing emails, and all the other bits and pieces. So there's a lot of things behind it. But how do you demonstrate that to an organization or to a potential customer if you don't have something that says, We've been looked at independently by this third party, and we've achieved this level of, uh, of performance. So 9100 has a couple of other things, which perhaps weren't necessarily written with cyber in mind, but arguably it's equally pertinent. So if we look at this side of things, personal and product safety. Product safety, most people will think in terms of uh, the safety of a bearing, a housing, an engine, or whatever. But product safety equally applies to the software within it, the firmware, the hardware. Selection and development of embedded software. Where do you buy your software from? Do you write it in-house? Is it bought in? What are the uh, criteria for supplier approval? What are the requirements that you flow down to that supplier of the software? And then the next one. Prevention, detection, and removal of foreign objects. Now, arguably, some sort of vulnerability or malware could be considered a foreign object. So it's looking at the standard and thinking about it in a slightly different way and thinking how it applies to what you're doing. Process and controls needed to manage critical items. I would suggest that the software is critical items. Controls to prevent delivery of non-conforming products. A built-in vulnerability could be considered a non-conformance, a non-conforming product. So in, when looking at 9100, if you are in this field, think about these clauses and think about what does it really mean in terms of the cyber side of things. It goes beyond thinking about the traditional hardware, engines, gearboxes, airframes, and so on. 
and another one potentially with a cyber twist. Do you outsource your software? Where are your, what's your supplier critical, uh, sorry, your uh, approval criteria for your suppliers? What do you flow down to them? What do you flow, flow down to them with respect to cyber security? How do you know they're doing it? You've got to look at all these outside things and make sure that you've considered it in the round. Transfer impacts, risks are managed. So thinking about risk, what do we do about risk management? Assign responsibilities for operational risk management. Decide def definition of risk assessment criteria. Thinking of, of it in a software hardware, firmware, cyber angle, rather than the traditional hardware side of things. Communication of risks, identification, implementation and management actions to mitigate risks. So throughout that side of things, how are you identifying those risks to, uh, with a, cy a cyber view rather than the traditional hardware view? And then if you're making or involved in deliverable software, there's a separate standard, AS9115, which if you're working under 9100 and providing deliverable software, you should also comply with 9115. But this model is actually quite good. It can be applied to a lot of things. So don't just think of it as being relevant to deliverable software. It looks at the relationship between information assurance, information security, cyber security. So it can be applied to all your thinking in this sphere. So it's quite a useful tool. Um, NIST. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Stephen at this stage to talk you through uh, briefly on NIST. So Stephen, over to you. Yeah, Brendan, yeah, thanks. Before I do that, just one point, just want to reiterate a point you kind of brought up there. You were talking about maybe the, the, the lack of understanding of how secure an organization is. Something I see all the time. So there's a lot of maybe naivety out there. People are people like you'd mentioned earlier. Oh, I have a firewall. I'm fine. I, I, I'm okay. I'm protected. But one of these, as you can see there in the in the slide, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, while it's not something you certify again, it's a it's a free framework that's being released to the general public. That actually gives you a tool to identify your existing security posture and how mature it is. It's kind of really good because it uses a scale between one and five. Five being maybe unattainable for a lot of organizations, but it may be, say, very appropriate for, let's say, the Department of the Defense, um, whereas they may consider three out of five to be a robust security program for a general company. It all depends on the asset. And that's what they kind of, no matter what type of standard or framework you kind of work from, have to first identify your critical assets. I always kind of I always kind of define what's an asset. I would say, well, what's valuable to your business? That could be people, that could be intellectual property, could be your IT equipment, your your actual planes, let's say. So you have to determine what are your assets, what are the threats against those assets, and then who are the threat actors? So actually, out there, who 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 might take advantage of you? Who really wants to attack you? Who wants to deface your information? Um, and Within this NIST cybersecurity framework in particular, there's 98 questions that kind of span across five domains, identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover. So it gives you a lovely framework and kind of guidance of how to say, well, what's my current security posture? And then it gives you ultimately, when you answer your questions, it gives you a roadmap to compliance. So compliance is maybe the wrong word, but bring in your maturity score up to what, is, what you'd like for your business. So it's all based on risk appetite. Um, NIST SP800171, while I'm no expert at specific standard, um, I'm very aware that it takes into account a lot of Annex A from ISO 27002. So basically, um, pretty much maps directly across with the ISO 27001 standard. Uh, can be very useful when you're trying to comply with DFAR and FAR. So yeah, back to you, Brennan. Thanks, David. Okay, so there are various other standards that are pertinent and I've just tried to uh, give you some examples of relevant standards to give you a sort of insight to what's out there. Um, so aircraft data networks, uh, digital information security, 
commercial aircraft information security concepts. There's a whole range of things out there that are pertinent, and uh, I'm sure we'll, that you will be aware of those that are relevant to your particular industry. But do do please look out and see what data is out there or what standards uh, are out there. And remember standards, some of them are certifiable, some of them are guidance. So the one in the middle, for example, airworthiness security process guidance to handle the information of security threat to aircraft safety. So there's a lot of information out there which can help you uh, depending on uh, what it is you do, where you're in the supply chain and so on. There's a lot of information to help. And then there's the regulatory side of things, whether it's the civil or the military. I've got the examples of DFARs and FARs here. So safeguarding defense information, cyber incident reporting under the DFARs. It uh, flows down to requirements on cloud computing and IT systems. And then FAR 52204, Federal Cyber Security Enforcement, minimum safeguarding measures. Bottom line is pretty much any contract you have now, whether it's from uh, government or military or any other organization, somewhere in there, there's going to be something about cyber security. Now, there would be different levels of cyber security. Uh, but if you're not able to uh, deliver that cyber security and assure your customers, your clients, that you have that compliance, then you're not in the running. So how do you demonstrate that you have achieve the required level of cyber security and more importantly go on to maintain it and improve it keep it up to date because nothing stands still cyber security challenges change pretty much every week so how do you demonstrate that thing how do you uh, when you're tendering for a, a, a DOD contract or a, a, a civil contract or whatever it is how do you demonstrate as part of your bid docs you are taking cybersecurity seriously, you can protect their IP, protect their uh, information, or even potentially protect national security if you're working in the military environment. So you need to recognize that these are now regulatory requirements. How do you meet them? How do you demonstrate that you've met them? So let's look at some of the things we can do. First thing, of course, is the responsibility. It starts with the board starts at the top of the tree, the CEOs, the boards have a fiduciary responsibility to manage cybersecurity risks. That was a global information security survey in 2018. Fiduciary, of course, meaning, well, it has two meanings. One is legal uh, and one is moral. So fiduciary, as it applies to the law, is about trust. And the other aspect of fiduciary is about financial value, so protecting the financial value of your organization. And I would say you also have a moral responsibility too, because ultimately this is about flight safety. Uh, so it starts at the top. The CEOs have that responsibility. So maybe they need a framework, something to give them a grounding to start on. And part of the solution, perhaps for you, may be organizational resilience. I mentioned it earlier on, BS 65000, which is not a certifiable standard. It's a guidance standard. Organizational resilience looks at the whole organization in particular, we're looking at uh, the operational, sorry, the informational resilience domain, which is in the bottom left. And the example there uh, talks about a cyber briefing. And that was um, uh, the Washington Post reported on the 8th of June that foreign government hackers had compromised computers of a Navy contractor and they stole massive amounts of data relating to undersea warfare, secret plans for a supersonic anti-ship missile. And that was the statement of the investigators. We had a cyber briefing, and it was shocking how disorganized, unprepared, and utterly clueless the branch was. Defense information lost. It's truly scary. So information resilience, perhaps, can be a start point to start, uh, enable you to build all the aspects you need for cyber security. So this is where the uh, bottom left comes in, securing information, protecting infrastructure, enabling trust and reputation. We talked about fiduciary responsibility earlier on. Ensuring regulatory compliance. We've looked at FARs and DFARs. And safeguarding people. We've talked about uh, your staff and your, your personnel uh, and your indeed your customers uh, and suppliers' personnel. So you need some sort of glue to bring all this together. And there are various standards, one of which is 27,001, of course. 
But what I'm going to do in a moment is hand over to Stephen, who's going to talk you through a little bit more of what can be done about these things. One thing to be aware of, though, is talent. And because there are organizations such as Google and Microsoft and Amazon and Facebook and various others, they kind of sweep the market of the talent. So one of the things you need to consider as part of your resilience is where do we get people of the high enough caliber to look after these things? And Stephen alluded earlier on to complacency. And CEOs, the board, shall we say, tend to be a, um, of a more senior generation who haven't been brought up with, uh, with this kind of information. So you need the people that really are, they live and breathe it. It's their everyday thing. Where do you get that talent from? Don't be complacent. Make sure you have the right talent with the knowledge, the competence to really ensure you have the defense in depth. And with that, I will hand over to Stephen. Cheers, Brendan. Okay, so just moving on to the next slide. So yeah, so following on, say, from the information resilience piece you just mentioned there, Brendan, we thought like, it would be worthwhile to go through the very high level, the typical services that cybersecurity information resilience provide across industry verticals, right? So we're, um, our customer base is extremely wide. But one thing I always kind of say is that security kind of, um, it, it's, it's kind of regardless of where you work and what industry you're in, security controls are security controls. And it kind of goes back to the element I mentioned earlier when I was speaking. It's about understanding what's important to your business. What are your critical assets? Um, before I get into it, I think maybe it's worth noting that the, the section of uh, BSI group that we're working, the Cybersecurity Information, Information Resilience, is made up of about 200 consultants. We're headquartered out of Dublin, but we operate across the United Kingdom and uh, through a recent acquisition, we're in San Jose in California. So we have a very, very broad range of consultants uh, and we, we do a lot of international delivery. Okay, so as you can see then from the slide here, um, we, we have four main areas that present a bit of a challenge to every company out there. First one being is about maintaining cybersecurity. I actually think it's a little bit more than maintaining. It's actually about figuring out, like I'd mentioned earlier, what is your cybersecurity posture and ensuring that you have a really, really good indication of where you stand. Uh, secondly, then, it's getting into the whole information management and privacy. That is very, very broad, um, and it completely depends on what your requirements may be. Uh, the security awareness training, I'll give an example in a moment. Uh, security awareness and training is absolutely essential. You need to think about your staff as an asset so they get, again, they're critical to your business. So you're protecting them by educating them. And fourth, we have compliance to requirements. I kind of look at this as the one within the four that's very much dependent on what vertical you sit in. Um, because if you're a retailer, and let's say if you're dealing with credit cards, ECI compliance may be the compliance requirements you should think about. But like if you're in the aviation, as we just mentioned, you've defires and fires. So it's very, very much dependent. Now, um, also, if, you're, if you kind of look over to the right of the slide, you can see our continuum. And that kind of illustrates, I suppose, the broad range of services that fall under each one of those four domains. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of, of what's in the continuum, but I really just want to draw your attention to um, maybe talk about a couple of key services that I suppose every company should consider, and I'm going to give you the reason why. So the first one being penetration testing. Okay, best practice or good practice, maybe I hate saying best practice, but good practice would state that you should do penetration testing on an annual basis or after a significant infrastructure change. It's up to the company to determine what that change, how significant it is. But some examples might be a major upgrade to a website with new functionality, or let's say if you're changing your firewalls or, or internet-facing infrastructure. This really goes back to what Brendan said at the start of it. It's about identifying foreign objects, right? Going back to your 9100 standard. So, or, or, or flaws in code. So a very simple example, if you have a website, let's say a booking website for, for a commercial airline, um, it could be very susceptible to something like SQL injection. 
that is very simply put someone entering a SQL code into where you put username and password and if that if that website is not designed appropriately they can reach in and pull the data out so what we aim to do is identify any weaknesses and give you the solutions and how to fix it second one would kind of be privacy and that's kind of broad right so that also depends on your geographical location GDPR being the, the main one that we work in but also things like the California Consumer Protection Act um, actually a recent a recent example I was in with an Irish uh, aviation authority um, giving training to all of the um, the uh, flight um, air, air, air control um, and they were talking to me about drones and they had a concern relating to privacy which I thought was quite interesting um, for every drone that weighs a certain weight in Ireland, you have to register. Uh, and a lot of drones are actually owned by people underneath 18. So that kind of brings in the whole GDPR element and miners' information. So we came up with a solution is, well, we suggested that the guardian of the child needs to register the drone rather than the actual miner, therefore alleviating any concerns about actually having any data that belongs to someone under 18 years old. So that's kind of some typical advice that we would provide. Um, moving on then, the end user security awareness. I really think this is important. It's the core to everything. Um, maybe to put some context, uh, I was involved in a security incident where someone had clicked on an email, clicked on a link, uh, malware downloaded to their PC, and because of the lack of separation or segregation in the environment, the malware propagated uh, throughout every system. The ultimate result was the company had to shut down for two weeks and rebuild all infrastructure, costing a ferocious amount of money. And that was based on one click by one person. Uh, the person wasn't at fault because they weren't getting training. Um, okay, uh, and then finally, uh, the last service maybe just to talk about is something like security audit or review. I think this goes back to the complacency or naive element we spoke about. I have never done a review of a firewall, for instance, that I haven't found multiple problems. No matter how good that company thinks they are, if you don't do a consistent review of your infrastructure, your configuration, uh, and code, let's say, you're susceptible to vulnerabilities and potential breaches. The one thing I want you to get from all of this, really, and yet again does boil back to something Brendan mentioned earlier, is the take home here is that every company needs to understand the importance of security and privacy and to ensure there's an adequate budget. And that's not just money, but that's resources, just to ensure that you can actually protect yourself. Um, ideally then, thinking about top level management, um, really if we don't have top level management buy-in, we have nothing. It's kind of destined to failure. So it's really, really important if you can go back from this call speak to your senior management, whether you are a member of it yourself or your colleagues, and kind of express that concern. Do we really know what's important to us? And actually, are we protecting it? And do we actually know what our security posture is? So moving on, um, a very, very quick slide, but um, just conscious of time, but tips for information and cybersecurity. It really, really boils back to what I've kind of been speaking about it's understanding the threats and risks but you can't do that without knowing what you're protecting and um, so intellectual property personal data anything that you feel has value communicating these risks and threats is, is is pretty much essential and with any effective information security management system maybe it's ISO 27001 or equivalent one of the key elements you have is an IT risk management framework and that gives you a fora and a, and a platform to identify risk and then communicate it effectively within the business. That is essential. You need to understand who owns the risk so that they are empowered to identify action plans to further mitigate and manage that risk going forward. There's an element of perimeter defense. I think we need to have a strategic approach to security. So if you think about it, a nice way of looking at it is thinking about the outside and working your way in because you're predominantly going to be impacted by say, people on the internet, but in the aviation industry, like the previous examples that were spoken about, you may have people 
who, whether they're staff or they're on board in, in, in an actual plane, who might be trying to attack. Um, really, really, we can't do this conversation as well without talking about good supply chain management. Thinking about third parties, thinking about fourth parties, and so on and so on, depending how long the supply chain is. We really, really need to look at this carefully. Um, there are definitely privacy concerns uh, because you might have data processors looking at handling or processing personal data, regardless of if it's, if it's European citizens or not. But also, we need to think about onboarding of suppliers and actual annual due diligence. So, so what's, your, what's, your, what's your methodology? You have to ask yourself, how do I know that my, my supply chain and third parties who are helping me provide my service to my customers are doing it in a manner that is, I suppose, commensurate to what my risk appetite would expect. And that's really, really key. So if you're hiring or engaging with a third party, you need to ensure, and it's a really, really big and important task, you need to ensure that they're acting in a manner that meets exactly what you would do yourself. So a lot of effort and focus needs to be placed in the supply chain. Um, I won't mention security training again because I think I've, I've labored on that. But really, the last point I'll talk about there is security culture. You will never, ever achieve security culture without that senior management buy-in, without a strategic approach, and without the adoption of a best practice framework such as the NIST cybersecurity framework or ISO 27001 or equivalent. So, Brendan, I think that's the end of my slides there. I think we'll jump on to the questions. Anyone yeah, um, th thanks for that, Steve. I, I, um, we haven't got any further questions. I, th there was one question from, uh, uh, from a, a gentleman I've already answered, but I will repeat it. He, he was asking about um, uh, the aerospace standards compared to the IATF, the automotive standards. Now, the automotive is actually specifying certain controls, whereas the aerospace doesn't. Um, we mentioned earlier on that it, it, it just has a kind of generic statement so it's not as robust however the potential consequences arguably are greater how many people do you get in a car how many people do you, do you get in an aircraft so there is perhaps a case to say that the aerospace standards need to be revised or they need to put in something rather more robust about uh, uh, cyber security on the other hand the other clauses I went through which uh, need to be looked at with a, a cyber mind mean that perhaps those things are covered. It's how do you apply that risk-based thinking if you are uh, integrating systems, embedding software, designing software, writing software, whatever. All the same rules apply. How do you uh, monitor those suppliers? What are the criteria? How do you verify the purchase product? How do you know that software does what it says? How do you know there aren't any vulnerabilities in there? So I suppose you've got to interpret the standards in a different way. I think that um, answers the question I had. I haven't got any yeah. other questions at the moment. There's so a, thank you for that question. question. Brendan, there's a, there's a question that I get asked all the time, um, mm -hmm. which may be of relevance. And it, it kind of comes from, um, I, I hear it at a lot of conferences as well, and typically what we're asked is, what, what's the kind of greatest mistake that a lot of companies make with regards to cybersecurity? And, and I have a very simple kind of response to that, and I, I, I've seen it in a lot of examples. Sometimes the larger the company, um, the, the worse their security can be because there can be elements of, let's say, red tape or politics or challenges in slow-moving uh, businesses because when sometimes smaller to medium companies can be slightly more agile and can change and adapt quicker to what's happening in the marketplace. But one area where I kind of mainly see companies fall down is they might spend a lot of money on tools, and which is absolutely essential, so to totally agree with that, but they don't think about in the cost element of that the actual required resources to run, manage, and respond to alerts that are identified by the tools. So I think that's something maybe to take away as well, that when, when a company is thinking about their cyber strategy and they're thinking about what technical tools, because it goes back to the people process technology piece, you need to, I suppose, think about the overall effort required and the overall resources required to, I suppose, operate as designed. 
as as you, as you hope it was designed properly. So look, that that's a that's a question I just wanted to get across. Yeah, thanks for that, Stephen. Um, so, in lieu of any other questions, um, I think we'll draw it to a close. There, we're just three minutes over time, so that's not too bad. So, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, listening to the presentation. Uh, we hope you found it interesting, and do please um, uh, respond to the the questionnaire. And of course, if there's anything else we can do to help you, then uh, you know where to come. Contact BSI. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Brendan. We also want to thank our attendees for the BSI Web Conference. You can anticipate an email from us uh, with a link to enroll in this recording within seven to ten business days. We're also going to ask that you complete the survey after this conference is concluded. You'll see a window pop up that you can fill in some information and give us feedback for future webinars. Please be sure to join us again. Visit our website at www.bsiamerica.com backslash events to view upcoming webinars. Thank you very much and goodbye.